Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar as a part of our Adulting 101 series, It's Okay to Not Be Okay. My name is Allison Tony, and I'm the Associate Director for Outreach and Engagement for Student and Recent Graduate Programs here within the Office of Alumni Relations. It is even more relevant today that we may not be okay given the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial injustices our country is enduring right now. The Office of Alumni Relations stands in solidarity in the efforts to eradicate structural and systemic racism, and we understand the grief that African Americans are experiencing today and every day. We work together to support one another and help each other. We hope this presentation will give you some takeaways, resources, and advice for staying well mentally and physically. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. Today's webinar is being recorded live to view later and will be sent out to all of our attendees and registrants. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's panelists by typing your questions in the Q&A pane of the control panel that you should see at the bottom of your screen. You may send in questions at any time during the presentation. They may be addressed during the presentation or at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce our panelists, Maylin, Steve, and Mia. Maylin is a doctoral psychology intern in the University Counseling Center. She received her bachelor's degree, master's of counseling, and anticipated doctorate in counseling psychology from the University of Memphis. Her current areas of specialization include trauma, sexuality, transition, and grief and loss, both death and non-death related. Steve is a psychology intern in the University Counseling Center. He received his bachelor's degree from John Carroll University, master's in psychology, and anticipated doctorate in counseling psychology from the University of Akron. Finally, Mia received her bachelor's degree and master's in counselor education from VCU and is currently working on her PhD in counselor education and supervision here at VCU as well. Mia currently serves as a health educator within the Health Promotion and Wellbeing Center, also known as the WELL. She focuses on promoting positive mental health through education on topics such as resilience, stress, self-care, and mindfulness. And I'll pass it over to our um, hosts and we welcome them, thank you. Allison. Hi, y'all. We're so excited to be here today. Um, as Allison mentioned, um, if you have any comments or questions throughout the presentation, feel free to let us know in the chat, um, and we'll also be engaging with you in that way as well. Um, but welcome to It's Okay Not to Be Okay with UCS in the Well. You've already heard a little bit about us, um, but again, my name is Mia Laitis. Um, from the Health Promotion and Wellbeing Center. Most of us, most people know us as the well. Um, and I am a VCU alum two times over. So I'm really excited to be with other uh, Ramley here today. Um, pronouns are she or they. And then if you wanna get in contact with me after the presentation, feel free to um, contact me through the email listed here. So if you actually haven't heard of us before, um, we are the Health Promotion Office on campus. Um, and all the work that we do centers around VCU students. Um, and so we really believe in helping folks practice safer, healthier behaviors by giving them real data, real information about ways to do that. Um, we believe in having inclusive spaces for folks so people should be able to see themselves in the presentations and in the work that we do. And we believe that health um, is really part of systems and not just on an individual level. Um, so we really advocate for systemic change um, that promotes healthier behavior in our office. All right, so you all got to hear uh, a little bit about me. I'm Maylin, um, pronouns she, her, hers, and uh, who I am. I'm a counselor or doctoral intern at UCS. Um, and you know, do a bit of individual therapy, group therapy, supervision, and also you can find me in my off time, playing around in my kitchen, and probably consistently and habitually watching The Mummy. Hi all, uh, my name is Steve Palmieri. I'm also a doctoral intern at University Counseling Services with Maylin. Um, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, my areas of interest and specialization are primarily in LGBTQ sex and sexuality, um, predominantly looking at the positive aspects of sex and sexuality for LGBTQ folks, 
um, as well as uh, sustainable social justice activism. In my spare time, you can usually find me eating candy, any kind of sugary foods or beverages. Um, so if y'all need to bribe me for any reason, um, then that's how. Um, or watching sci-fi, I'm a very big Marvel fan. Um, so if y'all have any questions about that too, and we have some time at the end, then let me know. So um, the mission at, uh, I keep saying UCS, but University Counseling Services is fostering an environment uh, for student growth, development, and psychological well-being. We do this primarily through like our clinical services. So again, like that individual therapy, group therapy, outreach, um, involving education and preventative work. Um, and I mean, one of the core uh, beliefs at UCS is that we're committed to human rights and equality by promoting uh, respect for individual and cultural differences. And um, so a lot of our work also is around just uh, removing barriers to student, uh, student success. So we would love to get an idea of who is joining us today. Um, so if you're able to go ahead and pop in the chat when you graduated VCU. Um, and if you want to throw out some fun facts about yourself too, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, so we're seeing some folks, 1999, 2015, 2016 and 2020, awesome. Yep. Cool, well thank you all for joining us. Um, ooh, sculpture student also. Um, yeah, we just love to get a sense of, you know, who we're talking to today, especially in this virtual space. So thanks for sharing with us. Here's a bit of a roadmap of um, how we're structuring um, our presentation for today. So we'll be discussing some frequently asked questions that we all get around mental health, um, some tips for how to take care and show up for other folks. And then um, again, we'll allot some time at the end to answer questions as well as throughout. So a question um, that I sometimes get in the work that I do um, is when it comes to self-care, how can I prepare for the unexpected, unexpected events? Um, and so some common themes that we've been seeing around unexpected events, um, folks may be far away from family during this time, may be hard to get to family right now. Of course, COVID-19. Protests are happening around us, um, depending on where you're located right now. Maybe let go from a job. I'm getting sick. And then trauma happening. Um, so that can show up in a number of ways for folks. Um, particularly, we may be seeing more of that um, publicized in the media, you know, it has been happening around us for a while, um, particularly around violence. So, um, you know, it may feel like this, where the fire is kind of going on all around us and we're just trying to manage, right? Um, and so that can be hard to do, especially when you can't predict the future. So one way to kind of start getting at some of the feelings of uncertainty, um, is to really take care of ourselves. Um, and there are multiple levels um, in doing that. So um, if you're unfamiliar with Maslow's hierarchy, um, it's really this concept that we need to take care of ourselves on um, these different levels in order to achieve our best self. Um, so Maslow would say that you can't graduate to the next level without fulfilling the level beneath it, right? Um, so for example, like you can't necessarily show up as um, a great friend if you haven't had access to food and water um, or feeling safe. So um, particularly, we've been seeing that folks um, have maybe been hanging out down in their basic needs due to current events. Um, and I want to normalize that that's been happening. Um, so if you've been feeling that way, you're not alone. Um, and so kind of doing your own check-in, like your own mental check-in of where you're at can help you kind of figure out what the next steps are um, to reach out for help or engage in some self-care. So, um, you know, 
kind of being intentional about taking that time to, to check in. And then if you're finding that, you know, it's really hard for me to kind of graduate to this ne next level if I'm having issues um, accessing food um, or feeling safe, then um, reaching out for help is okay too. And we'll give you some resources around that. So I, I also want to normalize that self-care um, has been kind of this um, kind really um, like trendy kind of topic as of late and self-care can look not so pretty sometimes and it often does. Um, so sometimes self-care really is like making sure we're taking care of our basic needs like making sure we shower, go get groceries, um, like drinking water intentionally. Um, and so this may feel extra hard, especially if you're having anxiety around getting groceries right now, um, or doing some of those basic um, basic tasks that um, have been a lot more challenging for folks um, due to health concerns. So just wanna say that self-care sometimes takes practice um, and it's an imperfect um, like process sometimes. So if you keep um, needing to go back and remind yourself of things, that's happening for a lot of people right now. So speaking of self-care, we want to know what have you all been doing to stay well during this time? How have you been taking care of yourselves? Let us know in the chat. Into a routine, getting some fresh air and exercising, great. Journaling. Like you took some of our recommendations right out of our heads, y'all. Reading for pleasure is a great one. <laughs> and I completely get the getting dressed and work clothes. We're going through those uh, routines that help us feel like a bit, uh, restoring like a sense of uh, normal same heard. Yeah, and one of the reasons we ask you all too is so that you can kind of get a sense of what other people are doing. Um, so we don't feel like we're existing in vacuums, like trying to give you advice, like everyone's trying to um, engage in some of that like self-care in different ways right now. And checking in with others, that's a great one. Yeah, like being intentional around that, um, making sure we're connecting with folks. Mm -hmm. So um, another question that I get pretty frequently is like, there's like a ton of like different information and products out there. Um, how do I know what's actually helpful when it comes to self-care? Um, and so, yeah, there is a lot of stuff out there. Um, I get a lot of questions around like essential oils, for example. Um, so like, does lavender like alleviate my anxiety? Um, like how helpful are like bath bombs and face masks um, and coloring. So, um, you know, for all of this stuff, um, it can be helpful if you are um, like experiencing stress um, or some anxiety in a way that feels temporary um, or like maybe not overwhelming. Um, so that's when you're probably going to get the most out of some of these products. Um, so if we think back to that hierarchy of needs, for example, like that face mask is only going to feel so good if you've eaten today, right? Or else it's going to feel just kind of like a band-aid that you're sticking on there. Um, so with all of these things, like taking them with a grain of salt, um, and that they can absolutely be helpful for folks, and um, you know they are not going to be a quick fix um, if you're experiencing something that's consistently overwhelming or um, like more severe. So I wanted to ask you all kind of how you feel about um, self-care and pop culture. Um, I've heard from some folks that it is less stigmatizing um, to have a lot of these products um, for other folks feel differently. So I want to kind of get a sense of the room and how you feel about self-care and pop culture. Let us know in the chat. Yeah, so engaging in that self-care can help um, with stress relief. Um, absolutely. So for some folks, they may feel more benefit than other folks. So um, 
not to knock anybody um, who use these products. For sure, we want you to use things that are helpful for you. Oh yeah, yeah. essential oils in the home, opening up the senses, yeah. I've heard they can also be helpful for grounding in the space, relaxing, short. I'm seeing the comment as well that it's hard to know like what to buy, hard to know what might work. My usual recommendation around that is whatever works for you is what works for you. Um, for some folks, essential oils might feel really soothing and relaxing. For some people, the smell might give them a migraine. Um, for some people, they really like taking baths and bath bombs might help. For some people, they might be really tall enough in their bathtub and that might be even more stressful. So my basic advice is that there is no basic advice when it comes to self-care. It's gonna look different for everybody. Um, and so if there's anybody out there advertising a one-size-fits-all solution to stress or depression or anxiety, they're selling lies. Um, <laughs> when it comes to self-care, it's important to tune into yourself and pay attention to what's actually helping you and to get creative and try out different things. Like sometimes coloring books can feel really helpful. For me, it just reminds me about how terrible of an artist I am. So self-care is gonna look different. And the most important part is to really pay attention to what's helpful for you personally. And we will have um, at the end of the presentation some self-care inventory. So if you're looking for like new creative ways um, of self-care, ways that um, don't require you to even purchase anything, um, we'll have that available because there are also times we don't, we may think about one dimension of self-care like physical or, um, but may not be thinking about like our emotional self-care or spiritual religious self-care. And so, um, you'll have some resources also to kind of look through and brainstorm some other options as well. Thanks for sharing y'all. So part of the work that I do is around mindfulness um, as a way to alleviate some stress, anxiety, um, and other forms of things impacting our mental health. So um, the reason that we use mindfulness is that um, as opposed to some other types of interventions, mindfulness has been shown across different diverse groups to be useful for folks. Um, so that's a pretty um, great, great thing. Because um, when we think about research, we think about like who is involved um, in the research, who is the population. Um, and with mindfulness, it's been shown to um, work across diverse groups. So. We, um, through this definition up here, to get us all on the same page of what mindfulness is. It's another kind of buzzword um, that we've been hearing in the media recently, but it's really this awareness that comes through paying attention on purpose, being in the present moment, and not judging ourselves for taking that time to be present. Um, John Kabat Zinn is kind of the Western guru of mindfulness, but mindfulness has been around for centuries. Um, and so the West has really adopted um, kind of a more secularized version of what mindfulness is. Um, but for some folks who are involved um, religiously or spiritually, mindfulness may be part of that practice. And it really starts with focusing on the breath. Um, and one of the reasons is, is that we can't breathe into the past and we can't breathe into the future. Mindfulness grounds us in the present, or breathing grounds us in the present. Um, and so what I would love for us to do, um, if you're willing and able to, is practice breathing on purpose with us. Um, and so there are certain ways to breathe that kick in our rest response. So when we're in our stress response, we typically breathe through the chest. That shallow breathing um, comes out. It's maybe a little more difficult to breathe when we're stressed. Um, because that fight, flight, or freeze response is really kicking in. When we're in our rest response, we're more likely to breathe through our belly, um, take longer, deeper breaths. Um, and so to help kick us out of that stress response and into our rest response, we need to practice breathing through the belly. What I'd love is if you're able to maybe put one hand on the belly, one hand on the chest, and uh, just feet flat on the ground if you're able to too, just so you can feel centered in your seat. 
And before we practice anything, just notice how you're breathing right now. Natural breath. Maybe you're feeling it, especially in the chest. Maybe you are feeling it through the belly. Now I want us to take a couple of deep breaths together. And when I say breathing in through the belly, I want us to imagine a balloon expanding in our belly as we inhale and contracting as we exhale. Right? Your belly is going to kind of jet out a little bit. Let's go ahead and take a nice big inhale in through the nose, expanding the belly. Maybe doing a couple at your own pace. And if you find yourself having difficulty directing the breath down into the stomach, a trick is um, if you actually put your hands behind your head like this and lean back in your chair and try that deep breathing, you will automatically be able to breathe into the belly and the belly will automatically expand on its own. You're leaning back to a certain point. So we do this to help us get um, grounded in our space the kind of foundation of being present um, and to really get us in our rest response. So doing that for a few moments um, intentionally can really get us out of that stress response that we may be carrying around um, when we don't actually need to use that stress response. So we wanted to ask, what are some cues throughout your day that you can remind yourself to breathe on purpose? Here are a couple, um, maybe, you know, we're all washing our hands all the time. Um, so maybe while we're washing our hands, taking a few moments to breathe, maybe it's um, right before eating, maybe it's before you get on a Zoom call. Um, what could it be for you? you can let us know in the chat. Um, to be a cue to breathe on purpose throughout your day. You get extra points too if it's already a part of your routine, right? Um, so before all of COVID was happening and we weren't staying at home all the time, my breath or my breathing cue um, was right before I started my car. Like I would sit in my car and like breathe for a moment. And I chose that cue because I make the same commute and have made the same commute for a really long time. And so I would kind of just show up at work and show up at home and not really think about the process of getting there, right? Um, so I really wanted to be more present um, as I was driving. So my cue was to sit in my car for a moment before putting my keys in and breathe. Yeah, so if you have like morning and evening stretching that you're already doing, that's like a great time to do that. Um, really preparing your body for the day or, or winding down in the evening. Getting about to start the project. Yes. We'll talk about some apps too a little bit later on, but that's, yeah. Great reminder. I'm all about the external reminders. Um, I know for me, like, because I'm at a computer so often, I will keep a post-it note um, with like questions of like, how is your heart? Is your breath happy here? Um, and I believe the last one was that, like, do you feel free? Um, which is a certain meditation, but um, yeah, all about the external. And for me, my Apple Watch taps me periodically, and also if my heart rate starts increasing, but I'm not actively moving, my watch will tap me and say like, hey, you're stressed, calm down. And so for me, I, I keep my watch on all the time and it'll remind me throughout the day and just kind of give me a gentle tap and then guide me through a breathing exercise. So if anybody has an Apple Watch, or I don't know if other smart watches do it, they might, um, I don't know anything about non-Apple products, um, but that can be a good way to kind of tap yourself and remind yourself throughout the day to practice it as well. Make it a part of that routine. Like, have it built into your schedule. Yeah, no shame in that. So, it can also get to a point where, you know, you're feeling stressed, you're engaging in all the self-care, and uh, you're still not feeling great. Um, you can be experiencing depression, anxiety, grief. Those are kind of the three main ones that we'll be talking about today. Um, there's a lot of other mental health concerns that folks can have, um, trauma, adjustment, stuff like that. 
um, the three that we're seeing really commonly right now are depression, anxiety, and grief. So we're gonna go over um, some of the signs to look out for that you might be experiencing those. And specifically why we're seeing these right now, a lot of it has to do with the environment that we're living in. Um, anxiety, depression, creep, those tend to be triggered by some unpredictability, some instability in your life. And right now there's a lot of that. Um, I saw, you'll see a lot of memes in these next couple of slides while I'm talking. I saw a meme recently that asked, what do you think the final boss for 2020 will be? Um, which is pretty on theme because like everything just feels so unpredictable right now. Um, we're all worrying about our own health, the health of loved ones. We're worrying about financial security. There's this general kind of feeling of hopelessness in our culture right now because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what to do. And we're all really just in survival mode. Um, we're detached from each other. We're feeling lonely. Even this, we're not doing in person. Um, and so it's important to be mindful of is some of those ways that even when we are connecting with each other through video chat, we're missing a lot of those social cues that remind us that we're safe, remind us that we're connected. And so really this is sort of a perfect storm for some mental health issues. And one of the really common ones that we're seeing right now is depression. Um, and so depression, you'll see the little emoji. Um, depression is sadness, but it's more than just sadness. Um, while well, anxiety is worry, depression, sadness, that's kind of the, the general way of kind of distinguishing them. For depression, it's a bit more. Um, there's emotional symptoms, there's cognitive or thought-based symptoms, and there's physiological symptoms. Um, so in terms of some of those emotional symptoms, usually depression is a feeling of sadness, emptiness, hopelessness, and that looks different across cultures too. Um, one of the big differences that we usually point out is that for women, depression might look like feeling sad, empty, hopeless. And for men, that can look like anger, irritability. Um, so it can look different for different people. Um, one of the really common symptoms that we see kind of across cultures is this loss of interest in activities. So the things that you used to do that you really enjoy, I know right now it's hard to do a lot of those maybe because of the coronavirus. Um, but if you're engaging in things that you used to really enjoy and just not finding them fun anymore, that might be a symptom of depression. If you find yourself eating a lot less, eating a lot more, sleeping a lot less, sleeping a lot more. Noticing those changes in sleep and diet are some early warning signs as well. Um, and being aware that you know a lot of folks' routines are changing right now um, and that in and of itself can kind of trigger this depression. Um, changes in movement, oftentimes one of the ways that we assess this is if other people have made comments about whether you seem to be slowed down or sped up. Um, obviously being away from other people right now, that might be hard, um, but paying attention to yourself, noticing whether you're feeling a lot more sluggish than usual, whether you're pacing around your apartment or your house more than usual. Um, one that's really common between both depression and anxiety is fatigue, or just the sense of being tired all the time. Some of that comes from the cognitive load of just being on Zoom constantly. Um, but also if you notice yourself just not having the energy to do things that you would enjoy, not necessarily that lack of interest that we mentioned, but just not feeling the energy to do things, that can be a symptom of both depression and anxiety. They really take a toll on you. Um, and it's also really common for depression to have these feelings of worthlessness or guilt um, and uh, to feel like um, maybe if you were to get sick, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Maybe you deserve to get sick. Um, to have these inappropriate feelings of guilt, I know right now we talk a lot about white guilt, um, which is different from the guilt that we see in depression, um, but noticing some of that oof, this is my fault, I feel really bad about this, I feel trapped, I feel hopeless, I feel the sense of despair. Um, those are things to kind of cue into and be really aware of and be really mindful of as well. Um, and in terms of thoughts of death and suicide, those are incredibly common, um, especially right now, death is really at the front of a lot of folks' minds. Um, and May will talk about um, both death loss and non-death loss in a little bit. 
Um, but having these thoughts of death, thinking, I just want to escape, um, is really a common one that we hear a lot. I wish I would go to sleep and not wake up. If you find yourself having thoughts like that, important to reach out to a mental health professional. And anxiety tends to be depression's ugly cousin. Um, they oftentimes go hand in hand, especially right now with all the unpredictability that's happening, um, for, especially for people of color, LGBTQ folks, um, having this heightened sense of unsafeness um, can really provoke a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of restlessness and tension. Um, <coughs> And uh, that cough right now may have triggered some anxiety for some folks. I promise you it will not go through the screen. Um, but oftentimes on anxiety, you'll find yourself kind of having these racing thoughts, having trouble concentrating, feeling more irritated than usual is a really common one with anxiety. People will come to therapy and be like, I just don't know why I'm so mad at people all the time. And when you check in and say like, okay, yeah, you're under a lot of stress. Like there's a pandemic happening, there's protests happening, there's police brutality happening, there's systemic racism happening. There's so much going on in your life that of course, like your fuse is gonna be a little short. Um, and so you'll notice that oftentimes with anxiety, there'll be this sense of being really on edge and that can show up in a lot of different ways. Um, some of the physiological changes that we notice is that muscle tension for me, I notice it in my jaw. Um, like when my jaw is clenched, I wake up every morning, I hear this loud cracking noise. I'm like, ooh, okay. That's a reminder to take a deep breath. Um, so you'll notice some of these uh, cognitive changes, like thought-based changes, some of those emotional changes, um, and some of those physiological or behavioral changes. Um, and I notice that we have a lot of folks who are helping professionals in the group as well. Um, and it's important to check in with yourselves too about whether you might be absorbing that from some of the folks that you're working with, whether you're absorbing that from some of the folks that you're helping. Um, so it's important to really check in about these things. And if you notice these symptoms start to come up and it's difficult for them to go away, it's important to reach out. Um, a lot of therapists now are offering teletherapy um, and we'll talk about some of those resources at the end, but these are some things to kind of keep an eye on to watch out for. All right, um, so transitioning a little bit to grief, I also want to name, you may hear a sound um, in my background that sounds like a small child. Um, I rest assured it is my cat. Um, she is quite needy today and apparently wants to be in on the call as well. Um, so yeah, I always like, it's going to sound weird, but like talking about grief. Um, it's something that we don't have um, that we don't have a lot of social space for even in ours as you all are alums of we um, even like celebrated life events such as graduating um, there's this social expectation that we're going to be very excited and it is um, exciting to some degree and in these transitions there can also be feelings of loss it may mean uh, of a move or loss of uh, comfort or security, um, loss of like identity within like a home program and what that means um, in transitioning. Um, and currently right now, and a lot of times our grief response, we think of that as our loss response to uh, death events. And while we absolutely can experience grief, this sadness, this anger, uh, frustration um, and a variety of other symptoms that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, we also can experience this in relation to a wide variety of things. So this, like I mentioned, graduation, um, currently experiencing uh, grief related to uh, COVID related transitions and also we're seeing so much more and hearing much more about the collective grief of um, Black communities and the response to racial injustice. And um, it, it um, 
it being something that often that response, that uh, grief response gets disenfranchised because they're not seen as um, socially grievable events because there's no identified person. Um, in some cases with non-death losses, there's no identified person or it may be difficult to describe. But um, as you can see like in the graphic here, there are a lot of different types of grief. We may have um, disenfranchised, which are those non like socially seen uh, losses, uh, non-death loss, ambiguous loss, where um, there is a degree of uncertainty around um, when the loss will be over. So thinking about uh, our experiences with COVID of not knowing when will life return to uh, as it was, will it, um, and in what way. And so it kind of complicating the grieving process because we aren't, um, there is no kind of like set end point. So the loss itself or grief response can kind of ebb and flow over time. Um, and so for the next slide, I have just kind of talking a little bit more about like the ambiguous, non-finite um, and disenfranchised grief. So with um, grief responses, you may have feelings of anger, guilt, sadness, as Steve kind of went through like depression earlier, loneliness, a feeling of hopelessness, um, numbness. And this can become complicated because the, as I mentioned before, the loss experience or the grief related to it may be difficult to describe because of the context. Um, so it may be ambiguous, it may be ongoing, um, and with a lot of uh, or grief related to death losses, typically we have rituals that uh, help us cope through the loss. We have social support. It's we have language to describe it. Um, but with our more like non-death losses, our ambiguous losses, those that are disenfranchised, that social support isn't as present or. Um, isn't as available, so making it um, more of an isolated experience and can intensify our response um, and resulting in a sense of like powerlessness and shame or even confusion around why am I experiencing um, these reactions. And so part of the reason I even just like to talk about grief is there's power in naming. Um, of naming the that the sadness um, is normative that or can be normative, and I think one of the, the things that we kind of look for um, as therapists and like to kind of ask about is is my grief is my sadness um, does it feel that it's impacting me in various areas of my life? So is it impacting my ability to work or is it impacting like my relationships, impacting um, school or, um, and in what ways? And so that kind of being a way to kind of take the temperature on when may I need additional support? And so we'll talk in a little bit about like, what are the ways that you can uh, receive support and, um, and also, um, yeah, what are the ways that you can receive support and some ways of coping? So um, we also just wanted to name some just additional considerations for taking care of mental health, um, some action items that if you would like to engage with them, um, maybe helpful for you or someone you know. So um, this uh, slide, also kind of refers specifically to some of the pieces that Steve and I had talked about in terms of like coping with like depression, anxiety, but also can be used for self care. Um, so basically, like there's no set way of coping um, and no like fixed timeline. And as Steve kind of mentioned of finding those self care strategies that are personally congruent and meaningful for you, they may not work for um, everyone and there's no one size fits all. And I always like to emphasize with grief if they're not being like a uh, fixed timeline. Sometimes with death losses, we may think, okay, I've got, I've got a month. Why am I still feeling this way? When, um, how meaningful uh, the loss is to you, the relationship with the person, or even with um, what has been lost, uh, such as like your routine or sense of normalcy, um, that may ebb and flow. And so kind of operating with compassion um, with self. So a lot of the things that we encourage are naming and validating the loss because with, especially with our disenfranchised losses, right? That there's not that language, not that social support. So in naming, um, we're able to um, validate self, but then also uh, share, have a shared or can have a shared experience with others, which helps us, um, you know, find meaning. And 
Also really encouraging the temper mastery piece is around predominantly like, or especially in Western cultures, we have this um, very like work orientation of like, I'm going to, I'm gonna work through this, I'm going to get over it, I'm gonna master this, this thing and then it's done. Um, whereas with, uh, with losses in general, um, it, it, uh, it typically like is a process that's going to ebb and flow and so to, uh, maybe temper our expectations around this being that there may be like a final like end point where I will no longer feel this way. Maybe just um, I like to think of it as a volume knob of like kind of turning down the volume. Um, also of identifying resources of what are like my personal resources, my creative resources that I have as a person, um, and also what are some external resources that we can draw upon, whether it's social support, more of informal social support, friends, family, um, uh, or uh, formal support, such as like counseling, going to the well, um, and let's see, oh, also this being related to the grief piece, um, which, we kind of talked about earlier, but they're not being a prescriptive treatment uh, necessarily for grief. Um, it's more of an unfolding process and avoidance at times, like maybe an adaptive strategy of if I am um, if I am at work uh, sitting in front of a client, then you know accessing you know the grief and pain that I'm feeling about um, something in my life may not be um, may not be the the time. Uh, to do that, so using like a little bit of avoidance or grounding in the present moment, but also um, allowing space to revisit. And uh, grounding skills, as uh, Mia had talked about earlier, can be you know, quite helpful. Um, and we have here uh, a link for uh, Prentice Hemphill, uh, who talks about grounding during protesting. So looking at as um, we are navigating the ways in which we are uh, fighting for social change, um, this and accessing anger, accessing sadness, um, and it can be overwhelming for our nervous systems. And so of how do we take care of ourselves in the moment um, if we're engaging in protesting or um, in other spaces and so they talk about uh, grounding methods for self but then also ground, grounding methods that you can do for uh, with others as well um, and lastly uh, kind of toggling between like you may need to toggle between being connected with others and taking a break and so I believe someone mentioned in chat that there are going to be times that you may need to step away like from a news feed but kind of looking at and finding that balance for you of um, connection and breaking. Um, so in addition, here are some more basic um, some basic tools that can make a difference. We've talked about creating and adhering to a schedule and um, the reality is our schedules may look very different than they did a couple of months ago. And so maybe a part of your schedule is getting up and stretching or um, maybe a part of it is like having a nighttime routine that you used to do um, before bed that you consistently did while you were in person working. Um, it's okay to throw those kinds of things on your calendar, like taking some time to meditate, taking some time to journal. Um, so you feel like you have a schedule that you can adhere to. Um, and then to May's point, kind of engaging thoughtfully with news and with social, social media. Um, some of us may feel like we want to consume everything. Um, and the reality is like you are going to be most helpful if you take some time to process the things that you're consuming. Um, so taking that time and engaging and reflecting is important with the things that you're taking in. Spending some time outside, I know folks said that some of them, some of our folks said they were doing that. Um, engaging in some self reflection and if you're experiencing some discomfort, like where is that coming from? Um, and some good ways to do that are through journaling, which I saw someone mentioned. Um, sometimes we're just like holding a lot of stuff in our head that we don't always like, realize. So getting it out and onto paper um, can be a helpful way to process. Um, or talking with a friend, um, especially, you know, if you are, you know, experiencing some discomfort and you just need to like get it out of your system and kind of process through what that looks like, finding an ally. Um, to do that with. Um, 
this is like goals, aiming for approximately seven hours of sleep a night. Um, that's what the CDC recommends for folks um, aged 18 to 61. Um, I know sleep has been a challenge for a lot of folks right now. So um, again, kind of finding that routine to like indicate to your body, I'm slowing down for the day. Um, like maybe it's like an hour before bed, I'm disconnecting. Um, or like I'm washing my face, like doing things that are signals to your body it's time to wind down. Maybe you are someone who's like, I don't know where to begin. Here's your start, right? Read up on policies and advocating for systemic change. Um, so, you know, engaging locally. Um, a lot of this stuff is online, right? There's so much that we have access to like right at our fingertips. Um, so really dipping into that um, if you're somebody who is like, I want to start contributing, but I don't know where to, don't know where to start, Google is your friend, right? Engaging in some kind of physical activity. So physical activity for me may look totally different than physical activity for you. So again, coming back to that, like self-care may not be one size fits all. Um, I know some folks who are like diehard runners and like that's their self-care, like getting it out of their system, like love that cardio. I'm more of like a yoga person and like that's helpful for me. Um, so kind of figuring out like what fits and kind of trying different hats um, in doing that. We've talked about intentionally connecting with loved ones as well. And this is, um, uh, I believe, available on our UCS website as well, but we wanted to list it here of, and so I noticed that somebody in chat had mentioned Calm um, to remind them about self-care, which is excellent, but uh, just some options around uh, meditations for anxiety and sleeplessness, um, addressing anxiety, depression, and stress, and um, things that you can kind of download for most of those are free, I believe. I know a lot of folks are like running um, like their apps for free for a few mm -hmm. months too. Um, so worth checking out. Mm -hmm. um, another question we get is how can I help others during this time? Um, and so here are just a couple of recommendations. Um, Trying to remain calm and avoid panic when you're with someone and practice patience. Um, so sometimes like we get in our feelings and that may not be necessarily helpful for the, the person that we're trying to help, right? Um, so kind of checking in with where you are before um, trying to go and help with um, help someone else um, is important because you want to show up in a way that is um, like ultimately helpful for them too. Mm. We got a question in the chat. Um, what if you live in a home that's not exactly nurturing, um, that's been a contributing factor to my mental health and emotional well-being, um, feeling stuck? Yeah, and folks um, from UCS, feel free to chime in on this one too. Um, yeah, I think, you know, that's a, a difficult situation and I wanna name that you are, you're not alone in that. Um, but I think like, Part of, um, part of that is like figuring out like where are some areas where you can have um, like some kind of control. A lot of that anxious feeling, um, as folks were saying before, is like comes from not feeling like you have a lot of control over the situation. Um, so, you know, whether it is like getting out to like go out for a walk like on your own and like having some of that like individual time, um, finding like a public space that's like available to you um, that you're able to access on your own, like really making that time for yourself may be important. Um, or if it's like getting out of the space and like engaging with like friends um, too, that may be helpful too. So like zooming in a park, um, creating a schedule that's like really feels like your own um, or just some suggestions that I'm coming up with off the top of my head. Do folks have um, some other suggestions? Uh, I would echo all of that and also say right now a lot of folks are finding digital spaces that feel affirming, um, which I know is not necessarily the same as being there in person. Um, but oftentimes if you're in a home that doesn't feel nurturing or doesn't feel safe, 
being able to find environments, whether those are physical or digital, where you can be affirmed in who you are, um, can feel particularly important. Just knowing that you're connected to a community where you will be accepted, where you will find that nurturing. Um, and so whether that's through social media, um, Reddit, different websites, news articles, um, finding stuff that does feel nurturing um, is particularly important. And finding a space, even if it's in the house, um, even if it's at a specific time or a specific place, um, whether that's like in the shower, a place that you can kind of escape to, um, and just knowing that you have that option to escape can feel helpful too. Yeah, really wanting to emphasize the last point uh, that Steve made this one uh, for me and Steve were both great, uh, great uh, suggestions, but really that uh, being able to sometimes create even like emotional boundaries like in, um, in the home by finding like that space and creating like a sense of safety uh, within that space is can be really like paramount during uh, social distancing times. I just wanted to name that we're right about at time. So if folks um, have some questions too that they would like to chat with us afterward, um, we'll also be providing our contact information too. Um, but appreciate appreciate the question for sure. Thank you for posing it because I know a lot of folks are experiencing similar situations. Um, I will um, also be sending this presentation um, to our folks at um, BCU alumni. So you should be able to access um, this information as well afterward. Um, sorry for going over on time, we're just so passionate. <laughs> um, just a couple of other ways to help a friend, um, you know, really being attentive and, um, you know, naming that you're willing to assist. Um, sometimes like even just saying those words can be healing and helpful for folks. Um, sometimes folks um, who are ex experiencing distress um, may have like some sensory overload. So depending where you are, um, thinking about like getting out of places that may be distracting or upsetting or disruptive um, might be helpful as well. Um, a valid stressor for folks, personal distancing. Um, so thinking about like, it may be your natural inclination to like go in for a hug um, with someone and not make, not feel great to them. Um, so using that consent piece and thinking about personal space and physical distancing is important too. Um, I just love this question. Do you want advice or do you want me to listen? Um, you know, that way you're not like trying to figure out like the anecdote of what this person needs or the anecdote. Um, you are asking them. Because um, some people really just need um, someone to listen to them and some people do want advice. So it's a great way to get at that. Um, noting that you may not be able to relate to what they've experienced, um, but indicate that you're willing to listen and learn. And um, again, there's so many resources at our fingertips. Um, and, you know, doing some of your own education can prevent that person from having to relive the experience by telling their story over and over again. Um, just an example, I had a colleague who said they felt like they were gay Google because people asked them about like queer issues consistently and they were always their go-to person. Um, when like a lot of those questions could be really easily accessed, like typed in online. Um, and I just think about like survivors of violence or witnesses of violence, um, where like folks are consistently asking them to like share their stories um, for their own like learning benefit. Like so much of that is already documented online and um, being a good ally is, is doing your research. Um, and we've mentioned this point before about, you know, being intentional about connecting. And I'm wondering, Mia, um, if, do we want to take a pause here to see if people have questions knowing that we're right at time or what, what do you all think? Because I know that we have some resources as well and we'll make the slides accessible, but. Yeah, I think this is our last slide before the resources. Okay. Um, Basically, you know, as we've emphasized before, of uh, connecting like with intentionality, and it sounds like a lot of you are doing that already by either, um, you know, 
checking in or you know finding virtual spaces um, so excellent work and resources for VCU students um, so and, and some of these are also available um, even post-graduation because you have access to the website um, but the Wells mental health resource list and we've got uh, links in here but also in chat um, we've got uh, contacting like university counseling services. So this number being our front desk number we, and also our 24 seven crisis services that can be accessed by calling this number. Um, our COVID-19 self-help guide um, and what is considered our mental health like care package, um, which you can download. Rams and Recovery, um, Division of Student Affairs, uh, the Keep on Being Well, and then two uh, self-care inventories that we had talked about earlier. And do you all have anything to add to that or things? Um, I think you covered it. A lot of these are open source. So even though it says VCU students and it comes from VCU, you will have access. Again, you will have access to these resources um, after this webinar too, in case you're interested. And I saw Allison has popped up, at least on my screen, so I don't know. Um, I know we're right at the end, so. Um, oop, I'm sorry, I was still muted. Um, but I did have one question that I thought maybe I'd just ask if um, you guys don't mind and if anybody who wants to stick around, but um, I thought it was really pertinent, especially in the workplace. What are some suggestions for for workplace strategies when dealing with mental health? For example, when I may feel triggered or anxiety at work, are there any strategies that I can put into place to help? I think several of the ones we talked about, like deep breathing, mindfulness, are things that you can do in any environment that can feel really helpful. Um, and depending on how open you are, I know as a therapist, it's a little, probably a little different in my workplace for us to be a little bit more open about when we are feeling triggered um, and able to take a break. Um, but if you do feel comfortable with your coworkers naming that you might need to step back or step out. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable, excusing yourself for a bathroom break and going and maybe splashing some water on your face, going and taking some deep breaths. Um, and then finding a space either with a coworker or maybe after work to be able to talk about it and process it if that's your style of processing. Um, but I think a lot of these techniques that we talked about one of the nice things about like deep breathing and mindfulness are that you can do them really anytime, anywhere. Um, and if it's something that feels like it's pretty consistent and feels like it's overwhelming and distracting, at that point, reaching out to mental health professionals to see whether or not therapy might be a good fit for you um, can help with some of that prevention rather than just responding to it in the moment, too. Um. Agreed. And one of the grounding strategies I like quite a bit uh, that you can use anywhere is something called five, four, three, two, one. Um, won't have time like to go through it here, but uh, you can, I believe that there are people on YouTube that also go through it. Um, and so it's really just kind of a grounding activity to get you more um, in the present and here and now. I saw someone in the chat mentioned mindful like meetings. Um, there's a ton of research that supports mindfulness in the workplace. So like if you are part of a work environment that is like, I need to see the research, I need to see the numbers, like there is a lot, um, there's a lot out there about that. And, um, you know, even there's some research that shows just like taking a couple of minutes to like breathe together before starting a meeting can help with mental clarity in the meeting. Um, so it just allows people to show up to the space and um, you know, bringing that to the group doesn't hurt, right? Um, the worst they can say is no, and then you can practice it on your own if you want to. Um, so yeah, just rest assured there's a lot, there's a lot to support doing that in the workspace. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mia, Malin, and Steve. This was really great and so such help helpful information. Um, we were so thankful that you were able to share your passion and expertise and knowledge um, on the subject matter. And I know uh, for everyone who's still tuning in, um, we'll share. Um, the plan is within 28 to 48 hours is to send out um, a brief survey as well as the slides and information and contact information for our presenters. If you would like to follow up or if we weren't able to get to any questions, um, I know they've offered, they're happy to answer any questions that you might have offline. 
um, or through email if you need to um, speak with them or have something else um, that you'd like to talk about. And I know they also talked about University Counseling Services offering um, a session to alumni, um, one session that um, to talk with a counselor if you need additional help or want some feedback or resources, um, which is great through VCU. And so we'll be sending out that following this um, presentation. But we thank you all for joining us and we hope everybody has a good rest of the day and we look forward to um, chatting again soon.